center and the south of America, you have a tremendously strong belief in God. And uh, the conservative Christians of America have a lot to do with the election of the President of the United States of America. They have a lot to do with politics. They lobby politics. But there are trends to drop God. There's a judge who's been fired in America for wanting to retain the Ten Commandments in the precincts of the courtroom. That debate is still on. But they're on the, there's a great number of people now who are trying to do a lot to do away with the influence of Christianity. And at a United Nations meeting a few years ago, there was a meeting on peace, and they called together thought leaders, political and religious, of all different, not all, many different groups. But Protestants were not invited. Protestant Christians were not invited to the United Nations meeting where they were going to discuss peace. It would be well to remind ourselves and to remind those who legislate of the blessings of Christianity. The blessings of Christianity are many. Universities, the major universities in the United States of America were founded by godly people to teach religion. The hospitals, the medical schools, the organizations such as the Red Cross. Already there's an alternative to the Red Cross called the Red Crescent. Libraries and literacy and education, human dignity and equality, classical works of art and music and literature. There was a time when they were the major themes. Christianity was the major theme. The value for morality and family life, the justice system, the appeal court is a biblical principle, the cities of refuge, relation to punishment, all have their roots in Christianity. But here's the best one of all. The blessing of Christianity, countless lives transformed. And you and I can be so thankful that God has touched our lives. And through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the mediation of Jesus, we have the assurance of salvation. He saved us when he died on the cross. He delivered us from the penalty of sin. He intercedes in the courts of heaven and delivers us from the power of sin. And one day he's coming back in the clouds of heaven to deliver us from the very presence of sin. Praise God. And what a hope, what a blessing to know this concerning Christianity. I'd like to just reiterate those words of Advance Australia Fair. With Christ our head and cornerstone, we'll build our nation's might, whose way and truth and light alone can guide our path aright. Our lives, our sacrifice of loves, reflect our master's care. And that text of John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth and the life, is the basis of that verse. And I wish that our two nations would uh, take this aboard. God defend New Zealand. Thomas Bracken wrote the words in 1870. John Joseph Woods wrote the music and it was declared the national anthem in 1977. And the official statement is, according to the records that I have read, that it's equal to God save the Queen as a national anthem. But you would know that things will change. You have seen the handwriting on the wall in so many countries, and you could expect that references to God such as that will be deleted. There's a debate in the Australian Parliament at the moment to eliminate the statement of the, saying the Lord's Prayer before parliamentary session, when the parliamentary sessions are held. And it'll, they'll win. The vocal minority will win in a world where God is not revered as he ought. I love the statement in your nation, our national anthem, God defend our free land, guiding her in the nation's van, preaching love and truth to man, working out thy glorious plan, God defend New Zealand. That's the fifth verse. And the fifth verse is not always sung. And of course, for all of the national anthem, there is a Maori version. 
I trust that it'll continue for a long time. Our lives a sacrifice of love to our loving Creator God, to our Redeemer Son, and to the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Along with many Christians, we hold belief in the Creator, in the Redeemer, and in the Holy Spirit. the dove of peace. Our lives are sacrifice of love to our families and friends, to our church and our community, to our neighbours and our nation. The little story of the keepers of the spring is very interesting. In Europe there was an old man who was employed by the local council to keep the spring clear where the waters for the village came from. He'd keep out the leaves and the rotting timber but uh, as times got tough financially for the little village, they decided they would do away with the keeper of the spring. And within 12 months, they were not able to drink the water. You and I have a commission to be a keepers of the spring. Keepers of the spring of the living water. To keep wise to the fact that there is an apostasy and there is an erosion of belief in Christianity. One way that you can help is by writing letters to the editor. We can become more vocal as a church and as members concerning trends that we see in doing away with the family as the basic unit of society. The Australian government is still holding to the family being mother, father and children. But that's changing and you know well about that. Love in action. We can give our all to Jesus. We can introduce others to Jesus. We can visit those in need. We can invite people to hear the gospel. We can note opportunities to give. And we to give time, talents and tithe. Don't you believe that we've become too apologetic? We are holding back from sharing and witnessing as we ought. The very least we ought to do is place magazines like the Signs of the Times in people's hands. But we can do more than that. We can give a personal testimony. Ruth and I visited one of my distant relatives up in Wahi Beach near Bowen Town. And while we were there, the volunteer pastor, Bruce Mason of Wahi, came to the home at their invitation because... He was their mechanic. He's the volunteer pastor there for some eight years at Wahi Beach, but he's also a mechanic, and they have their work done with him. Ruth and I were just so delighted at the personal testimony that Bruce gave to our relatives. In a very diplomatic and caring way, he told of how his life had been changed by Jesus. He told of his search for biblical truth, and how he tested various belief systems and came to the conclusion that the seventh day was the Sabbath and he believed in the state of the dead as we know it and it was a wonderful to hear a layman make such a positive testimony and it was so well received because of his sincerity. We must not retreat from giving a statement of our faith. Alan White has made a very interesting statement that I have quoted in the 25 years of my youth ministry, that we are to tell people how we found Jesus, not how we left the drug scene, not how we left the Roman Catholic Church. Tell them how you found Jesus. Tell them of the joy and the gladness that's come into your life as a result of finding him. Many will awaken as from a dream. Do you get the picture? People spiritually dead. They don't want to hear anything about Christianity. They don't want to hear anything about God, the Bible. But as opportunity comes, you tell them how you found Jesus. What a joy Jesus is to you. How you're living an abundant life. How you have a hope and assurance of eternal life. And what's the promise? They will awaken as from a dream. Authentic giving is modelled by Jesus. He gives us the servant model. He gives us the service model. 
and he gives us the sacrifice model. And you and I need to be truly servants for the master, giving service and speaking of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has made for us. Improving your serve. It could be that someone has this scripture to read. Was someone appointed to read 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 to 7? Don't worry. We'll summarize it here on the board. If you just were to turn in your Bibles, you'll notice this passage of scripture. We are to give anonymously. It says the churches gave. It doesn't name people. It was anonymous giving. Generous giving. Voluntary giving, personally giving, and I like the statement, it says the grace of giving. Giving is a grace. Giving is a gift of God. And picture there are Pastor John and Beverly Carter, many known, known to you, from 3ABN. Ruth and I have had the privilege of working for five months over a period of two years in Los Angeles at the Carter Report caring for the office and the church while John and the team went to India and then into Russia. And I have discovered that in India there are 22 states and eight of those states have already made a law or are in the process of making a law that it's a criminal offence to become a Christian. That it's a criminal offence to persuade someone to become a Christian. In other parts of the world, there's a death sentence to those who become Christians and to those who persuade people to become Christians. We still have the opportunity, even in India. John took meetings for 11 nights. Instead of 23, he was asked to leave the country with his team within 48 hours for his own protection because they, a group of militants said they were going to stampede the stadium and they were going to kill John Carter. John wasn't intimidated and would have stayed, but he was advised by the local church it was best for them and for him if he were to leave. Do you know the meeting that stirred them up in India? It wouldn't stir people here. Jesus Christ, divine son of God, saviour for our sins. That was on the billboards, the sides of buses, on television, on the hour, every hour, and instead of 19,000 people attending the meetings on the Bible and generally or on prophecy, 31,000 mainly Hindus came to the meeting, Jesus Christ, divine Son of God, Saviour for our sins. That's a part of the world and a large part of the world where people do not believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God and Saviour for our sins. I'm happy to tell you that more than a thousand DVDs have gone into India for television stations and there are three major networks in India that are preaching the everlasting gospel through the medium of John Carter. So I pay tribute to John and Beverly for their whole ministry. He's retired like me. Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 to 20 would be one of my favourite passages of scripture. Paraphrased, it says, go, go ye, go ye and teach, go ye and teach all nations. And one of the men who God used to open up Africa was David Livingston. And that's a picture of the um, statue of David Livingston at Victoria Falls. Ruth and I lived in Zimbabwe for five years. I was youth leader for 13 countries of Africa for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And they were very wonderful years. David Livingston opened up the continent for Jesus. And when he died, he died on his knees with his open Bible on the bed and his head in the open Bible. Africans took his body a thousand miles across to Mozambique, persuaded the captain of a ship to take the bale of cotton to London. And when they took, opened up the bale of cotton, here was the body of David Livingston. If you go to Westminster Abbey today, you'll find all but one part of David Livingston's body buried there, right down the front near the, in the aisle, there is a tribute to David Livingston and these words, let God's blessing be on any man who helped to heal 
the open sore of Africa. He was referring to slavery. He was referring to the slavery of sin as well. He opened up the country. I mentioned that most of his body was there. The Africans were so paid so much tribute to David Livingstone that they performed open heart surgery. They took out his heart and they buried it under a big tree in Zambia. He was a man that God used. Another one that he used was, as he was a missionary doctor, another one that was used was, the, was uh, William Carey. William Carey spent 40 years ministering in India before there was a convert to Christianity. Norman and Alma Wiles, Australians, went to the New Hebrides. Norman died of Blackwater fever. Norma had to, Alma, Alma had to bury him. After she recovered from that, she went back to serve in the mission field. And Len Barnard, who's featured in that Longburn centenary book, a graduate of Longburn and Longburn only. He didn't go anywhere else. That was his training. He learned to fly on an old World War II plane in Hawra and became a pioneer Seventh-day Adventist flying doctor missionary. So we can thank God for what he has done, and I hope that from this service today in commemoration of Anzac's serving and the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you and I will do what we can to help people find an abundant life now and to find eternal life. Shall we conclude our service with the singing of hymn number 79, O Love of God? <laughs>